Dan is second to none. I don't see Dan but once every three years. Um, I got a big kick out of helping him when he had his uh, triple bypass. I'd go over to his house and we'd take this little walk around his driveway and he was so infirm and in such pain. And I felt good that I was helping him, that I could do something for him because mostly he used to do things for himself. He was the quintessential producer. He knew everyone's job. And he knew it well. And he parlayed that as a director as well. I was talking to some of the people up in Canada who were going to be working on his movie that he's doing about the priests. And they were telling me, and these are pretty seasoned guys, they were telling me about the time that Dan came up last time to do a movie up there and some wise guy, one of the grips or something, said something about it. Well, you know, uh, hey Dan, I don't know what the hell you're trying to do, but that's not going to fit on that wall. And Dan said, if that doesn't fit on the wall, he said, you could punch me in the mouth. And by this time, everyone wanted to punch Dan in the mouth because he was so pushing. Well, this grip thing, whatever it was, fit perfectly. And then the guy said, you want to punch me in the mouth, Dan? And he said, nah. <laughs> but he was a fighter, you know. He didn't take shit from anyone. Network executives didn't matter. He believed in what he, and he still does, in what he does. And there are very few people around today that do that. Most of them turn coat. You like bananas? I'm a banana. You like non-realistic television? I've got four writers that could do that. They don't stay by their guns anymore. And he always did. As far as I remember, always did. And you better know your stuff if you want to come up against him. And he's very loyal. Dan's first show uh, that he directed of Dark Shadows was, was a nice experience. He was a little nervous. It was great to see him a little nervous. And Leela Swift kind of uh, was there to back him up in case something happened. Or if she made a suggestion for a different angle on a shot. And... Uh, we had a good technical, di technical director, and Dan just absolutely went about it as if he'd been doing it all his life. It was never a problem. He never stopped to say, well, <clears throat> should I bring the boom in now, or should I do this? He just did, and it all worked. It was outrageous, and the storylines became outrageous. And our ratings kept going up higher and higher. And then we made the deal to do a film. The first Dark Shadows film. And Dan directed that. And it was done at Lindhurst Estate in Tarrytown, New York. And it was a pretty accurate and rather bloody story. Now, a number of the parents of young kids who watched this show on television during the day never really knew what the hell their kids were watching. But for the movies, they would go with them. And they started to see Barnabas and blood and you know, biting necks and stabbing. And, uh, and our <coughs> ratings started dropping, which was very weird. And there was a clamoring to do a second movie because it was very successful. But Dan was a little hesitant, didn't know if he should do a second movie. But I think Dan wanted to do movies. So, in fact, he did a second movie, and it was very good. And the ratings went down more. And by that time, the show had run its course. But Dan was a film director, and a good one. Grayson Hall was, was a, a Hollywood dream. She was just this magnificent wackadoola uh, combination of six different well-known old-time actresses. Um, everything was dramatic to her. I mean, putting on a pair of shoes was a major aria. But she was very connected. She was married to Sam Hall, one of the writers, and she was very connected to a lot of in places all over New York. So if you wanted to go see, you wanted to go to dinner somewhere and go see a show, Grayson was the one you'd see. She'd get the tickets, she'd get the seats at dinner. And um, I liked Grayson. 
I liked her a lot. Jonathan was just a very lucky man and a very uh, a very gentle man. Jonathan had a, a background that provided the absolute perfect stuff for the part. He was raised in such a way that he had the natural manners of a person well born. He dressed well, he spoke well, and, uh, and he enjoyed the part immensely. And when it came time for him to bare his fangs and the music played, it scared the hell out of people. But I like Jonathan. Thayer was great, Thayer was fun. He took his role very seriously. I loved Louis, sorry he passed on so early. Louis brought the touch of class of Newport when we were in Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island to the show. I was at that kind of above the, the fray. He spoke better than everyone else and you kind of listened to Louis. Some of us laughed behind the flats, but he was good. He was good. Joan Bennett was my buddy. She was great. She was going with a fellow, David Wayne, I believe his name was. David Wilde. Wilde. Gee, you know more about it than I do. Uh, David Wilde. And uh, she invited me to play um, bridge at her beautiful apartment every Friday night. She had an apartment of 72nd and Lex. Gorgeous place. And so I got to know her that way. And she'd tell me a lot of Hollywood stories. That big thick lipstick of hers, you know. God, I'd see it on the glass when she'd put it down. She's a nice lady. Nancy Barrett was uh, beautiful. Um, the, uh, the quintessential little uh, heartthrob on the show. Um, she could play different personalities quite easily because she had a certain uh, uh, mythical quality to her. And um, I haven't seen her in a while, but she was a very good actress, a very good actress. Catherine Lee Scott, we remain friends to this day. She is just a, a sweetheart, a hard worker, a talented lady, someone who doesn't let things stop her. She was told she can't do something, she goes ahead and produces a movie. She was told she can't open a publishing company, she opens a publishing company. She's a very bright young lady, and, uh, and I have great respect for her.